Hello everyone and welcome to this section. In this section, we're going to give an overview of regression metrics, which is um, if we have, if we build a regression model, okay, either if it's a simple linear regression model, multiple linear regression model, or a polynomial uh, regression model, what we wanted to do is we wanted to assess the performance of the model. You want to see if that model is good or not. Does it actually, um, can we deploy it in practice? And can, can we use it to predict data that the model has never seen before? Okay. So to do that, we're going to cover kind of the most important metrics. So let's go ahead and get started. First is how can we assess the model performance? Okay. So after we perform model fitting, which is simply, we took all the data, we divided them into training, and testing and then we take the training data which is let's say maybe 80 percent of all the data i have and we train the model we fit the model okay so now we have a regression model that looks good so after we perform model fitting we would like to assess the performance of the model by comparing the model predictions to actual true data so what we do is after we take our train model and then we're going to deploy it in practice so we're going to use, for example, let's say the 20% uh, of the data, which is the testing data, to assess the performance of the model, okay? And a very important kind of key point uh, to illustrate is that testing data, one of the requirements for it is it, has, it, sh it should not be seen by the model during training. So the model should not have seen it before ever during training. And kind of, you know, a, a metaphor for this is, uh, let's assume that you are, for example, let's say a student, and you know, like uh, as a professor, for example, what you do is that you give the student a couple of exercises, right? So the student keeps training and training and learning and so on. And then during the test, okay, when you actually test that student, you do not give them the exact same questions that you train them upon. It doesn't make any sense because that it becomes like a memory dump, right? You're just feeding in information to the student. The student just memorize it and go to the exam and actually retrieve that information. And that's it. We call it today. This is obviously not the way to learn. We wanted the model to generalize. We wanted the model to learn and to like apply that learning on a data set that the model has never seen before during training. Okay. All right. So let's get started. So let's assume that we have, again, our ice cream cart, our ice cream example. And we wanted to develop a regression model that models the relationship between the temperature on the x-axis and the revenue on the y-axis. So I went out there and I collected data, you know, as an ice cream, let's say, cart owner or a business owner. We said, OK, at maybe temperature, let's say 10 degrees C, the revenue was very small as the temperature goes up. You know, like people tend to like ice cream more. That's why the revenue becomes higher. So we collected this data set and then we fit our linear regression model. So we fit straight line that can best fit our training data. So the question is, how can we evaluate the model? So what we could do right now is to do this is that we're going to calculate the error, okay, which is the difference between what the model is saying, so these are my estimated values, and that's what we call it the predicted values. So any point here that lies on that line, these are estimated or predicted, okay, because, because they're coming from my equation, they're coming from my line or my fit. However, these are the true data points. These are my true label, and that's why we call this Y actual, or YI. I stands for an index, which can be 0, 1, 2, 3, depending on which data points we are referring to. And why I hat, okay, this referred to estimated or predicted. And that's what the model is saying. So what we do to do this, we just calculate what we call it a residual, which is the error or the difference between the predictions minus the true or the ground truth. Well, if the model was perfect, then that means the, the estimated will exactly match our, um, our true label. So what is the error will be basically equals to zero. Okay. All right. So now I know how can we, uh, how can I calculate the error for each of these points? So now I have, I'm going to have error one, error for the second data points, error for the third data points, error for the fourth data point. 
The problem is, how can I combine all that information? How can I combine all this error into just one metric? And that's the beauty of it. That's why we're going to be covering in this lecture all the different metrics that can rely on that difference, on that error. Again, please bear in mind that here, all this calculation, we're going to be doing it or repeating it for every point. Because here I have subscript i, which means I have an error for this point, error for this point, error for this point, and so on. And now I need to calculate the error just as given one number. So I want to combine them somehow. Okay. Another note, or another important point, is that here, okay, uh, here I'm trying to calculate the error for the exact same data. So here I'm, this, this is my training data, and that's how I fit my model. And I'm, I'm trying to calculate the error for the training data. In practice, we're going to have another data points, which is our testing data points, that we're going to calculate the error um, based upon. Okay? All right. So the first metric that we're going to cover is what we call the mean absolute error, or MAE, which is pretty simple. Mean absolute error is obtained by calculating the absolute difference between the model predictions and the true or actual values. And first, why it's called mean and why it's called absolute. First, it's called absolute because we're going to calculate the absolute value, simply put. As you guys can take a look at the equation, you will find that I'm going to take every point with subscript i, calculate the difference between the yi, which is my model um, true values, minus my predictions, which is yi hat, that's what the model is predicting. I'm going to calculate the absolute value, okay? And then what I'm going to do, is I'm going to obtain the average, just average all these points, which is pretty straightforward. I was just going to basically sum them up, sum all these, uh, these errors. So basically, I was just going to calculate the absolute error for here, absolute error for here, absolute error for here, and whatnot. And then I'm going to simply sum them up and divide by the overall number of samples or number of data points. That's all what it is. And that's why it's called mean absolute error or MAE. So MAE is a measure of the average magnitude of error generated by the regression model. And again, these are the steps to calculate it. First, we calculate the residual of every data point. Second, we're going to calculate the absolute value, which is the objective mainly is to get rid of the sign. So, you know, here the sign would be positive all the time. And then we're going to calculate the average of all residuals. Just so sum them up and divide it by the overall number. Well, if MAE is zero, this indicates that my model predictions are perfect. That's great. That means it's exactly matched and we'll call it today. Okay. All right. The next metric we're going to cover is what we call it the mean square error or MSE. It's actually pretty much the same similar to the previous one. But then instead of obtaining the absolute value, I'm going to take this and just square it instead. So let's take a look at it. So MSE simply, we're going to take, okay, the summation of all the samples, yi, minus yi hat, or estimated, I'm just going to square them up and divide by the overall number of samples. And that's what we call it mean squared error. MSE is actually very similar to mean absolute error. But instead of using absolute values, we're going to square the difference between the model predictions and the training data set. MSE values are generally larger compared to the mean absolute error. Why? Because we simply square it up. So because we are taking the residuals and squaring them up, so you'll find that in general, MSE will be larger than mean absolute error. And in case of data outliers, if we have an outlier within the data, MSE will become much larger compared to MAE. Think of it as kind of we are penalizing the mistake. If we made a mistake, okay, this, this error will be squared. So we are penalizing it. And the MSE, in MSE in general, error increases, again, in a quadratic fashion because we are squaring it up. While in case of uh, MAE, it increases in a proportional fashion because here we're not squaring it. We're just, it's, direct, it's proportional, basically. Here it would be quadratic because we're having a square term. And in MSE, since the error is being squared, any prediction error is being heavily penalized. We're actually going to punish it much harder if in case um, of, a, of an outlier or in case of major error. MSE is calculated by the following steps. First, 
we calculate the residual for every data point. Second, we calculate the square value of the residual. So we take the residuals, we square them up, and then we calculate the average. So simply sum them up, the squared values I mean, and then we divide by the overall number of samples n. All right, okay, looks great. The next metric is what we call it root mean square error or RMSE. So root mean square error is actually pretty simple. We take the exact same values here and we're just going to square it. Get, I'm sorry, obtain the square root for it. So the question is why? Why do we need it? So the problem with MSE or mean square error is that here the units are very different to the actual data points because we already squared them up, right? So it's hard to compare. And that's why if we obtain the root mean, if we obtain the square root of this data, then we're going to go back to match the units of the original data. So good, then now I can compare it, okay? So root mean square error represents the standard deviation of the residual. If you guys recall in the statistics that standard deviation is a measure of the dispersion from the mean, which is how much am I spread away from the mean, okay? So RMSE can be easily interpreted compared to mean square error because RMSE units match the unit of the output or match the unit of the original data. Here, simply, I'm squaring it up and then obtaining the square root. So it's kind of canceling the effect pretty much. Okay. So RMSE provides an estimate of how large my residuals are being dispersed. Again, it's a standard deviation. Okay. And the steps to calculate it first, we calculate the residual for every data point. Second, we calculate the square value of the residual, the second step. And then we calculate the average of the squared residuals, which is exactly step one, two, three, or exactly the same as before. And then we're going to obtain the square root of the results. And then we're going to come up with the RMSE, or root mean square error. All right. Okay, looks great. The next metric is what we call it the mean absolute percentage error, or MAP. So one problem with mean absolute error values uh, or metric is that mean absolute error can range from any number between zero and infinity. So you can actually give it whatever number you want, which makes it very difficult to interpret as a, uh, the results compared to the training data. Okay, And that's why giving the answer in a form of a percentage is actually very beneficial because everyone can understand it. I can say, for example, my error is, let's say, 5%. Or maybe my error is let's say seven percent it's understandable however if i'm for example in my example here the revenue i can tell you my error is 10 or my error is 20 or 30. okay like uh, how can i assess that compared to my training data it's a little bit harder to interpret that's why percentage error I actually prefer it to give me an idea of how far off i am um, compared to my testing data or more the actual true labels so mean absolute percentage error, or MAP, is the equivalent of mean absolute error, but provides the error in a percentage form and therefore overcomes the MAE limitations. Mean absolute percentage error, or MAP, might exhibit some limitations. Why? If the data point value is zero. Okay. Why? Because there's a division involved. Let's take a look at it. So MAP is simply, I'm going to take, okay, every data point, I'm going to subtract the estimated. So this is a true value. This is my estimate. So that's my residual. I'm going to divide by the original value of the data point, which is yi, and then sum them up, and then get the average, divide by n, and then I'm going to multiply it by 100%. So that will give me a percentage value as compared to the actual value of the data point. So I'm getting the error divided by the original value of the data point, sum them up, divide by n, so I obtain the average of all of them, and then multiply by 100%. So the problem here, if my point yi is 0, then I'm going to exhibit some problems, okay? Because I'm going to divide be dividing by 0, all right? Okay. The next metric is mean percentage error, which is pretty simple. So instead of having the absolute, I'm just going to remove the absolute. And that will give me kind of, you know, like um, an insight of how many positive errors are compared to the negative ones. I'm not going to be here. I can cancel them, for example. However, here before in the map, because I'm obtaining the absolute value, 
I'm not gonna if the the, the 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 sign doesn't matter. Okay, so if they are positive or negative, it doesn't really matter. Here it matters. So MPE is similar to the map, but without the absolute operation. So it's exact same equation, but without the absolute. MPE is useful to provide an insight of how many positive errors as compared to the negative ones. And MPE can be calculated as follows. All right. Okay. Sounds great. And that's all what I have for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In the next lecture, I'm going to walk you through an important metric, which is what we call it R squared or coefficient of determination. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Let's recap. So in this lecture, we um, covered kind of an over overview of regression matrix. So I've been able to see how can we calculate the error first, which is the residuals, difference between the true or the ground truth minus what the model is saying. And then we knew the mean absolute error by simply containing the absolute and average them up. And then we discover the mean square error, which is by just obtaining the difference between the, um, uh, between the predictions and my true ground truth and squaring it up. Okay, and that's all what it is. And then we learned the uh, root mean square error, which is simply um, the mean square error that we had before, but we obtained the square root just to come back and make the unit match the units of the output. And then we have been able to come up with a percentage value using the mean absolute percentage error or map by simply obtaining the absolute value of the residual divided by the original value of the point and multiplying it by 100 to give me a percentage uh, value. And then we have been able to obtain the MPE, which is mean percentage error. Just instead of having the absolute, I just got rid of it. And then I came up with an estimate um, just to get an idea of how many positive compared to how many negative ones. And that's all what I have. Best of luck and see you guys in the next lecture.